Today we would like to welcome the renowned poet Terence Hayes. He received his BA from Coker College in Hartsville, South Carolina, and his MFA from the University of Pittsburgh Writing Program. Since then, he has gone on to author several books of poetry, including Muscular Music, which won the Kate's Tufts Discovery Award, Hip Logic, winner of the 2001 National Poetry Series, and finalist for the Los Angeles Book Award, Wind in a Box, and finally Lighthead, which won the National Book Award for Poetry. Other marks of distinction include a Whiting Writers Award, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. Currently, he is a professor of creative writing at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University and lives in Pittsburgh with his family. Tonight, Terrence Hayes is here to share with us his most recent work, Lighthead. The poetry within this book is inspired by the culture and society that surrounds all of us. His poems feature contemporary, literary, and historical figures such as Malcolm X, Tupac, and Gwendolyn Brooks. Hayes utilizes the words and forms of his po poems to illuminate his critiques of American values while still praising the strength of our society. He crafts poetry that allows his audience to relate to it. In Lighthead's opening poem, Hayes writes, you could spend your whole life doing nothing more than preparing for life and thinking, is this all there is? This is an ironic way to start a collection that contains so much insight into personal, political, and historical stories. This collection centers around how we construct identity and experience, and the poems provide a balance of reality and dreaming in their exploration of topics like race, love, addiction, and fatherhood. Using a wide range of techniques and forms, Hayes' collection is unpredictable and rewards the invested reader with inspiration and understanding. When reading and reflecting on Lighthead, I kept finding new ways in which his poems were innovative in both form and content, as he breaks from traditional poetic models and features contemporary individuals like Fela Kuti and Luther Vandross in his verses. I think that this is why the collection stands out. This is a poet of a new generation, complete with fresh, fresh allusions and original ideas about what constitutes a poem. Hayes has been characterized as an unblinking truth teller, and Lighthead offers the reader a look deep inside the mind of one of America's most important poetic voices. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Terrence Hayes. Thanks for the intro. Was that Rachel and Brian? Is that what y'all's names were? Thank you. I hate all the other stuff about, you know, awards, but I was excited as soon as you started talking about the work. So is that what I'm doing? All right. Um, so yeah, I do want to do the, uh, hold on, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I do want to do the uh, intro. So, I mean, the, uh, the Q&A more than anything. We can start with the Q&A. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll read some poems, and then we can talk a little bit. Um, you know, I, I typically do read what I think of as sort of the easier poems in the book, because I figure, you know, most people haven't seen the book yet, but I know there's some people in the audience who have some familiarity with it, so maybe I'll throw a little, a few, you know, crazy things at you tonight. But this is one of the poems, um, if we are talking about, like, being in dialogue with other poets, this poem is called The Golden Shovel, and it's early in a book, uh, and inside the poem is... Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, We Real Cool. Uh, we real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin, we jazz gin, we die soon, you guys know this poem. So I'm just sort of writing towards that. But it just grows out of uh, having gone to pool halls back when, you know, this is before like secondhand smoke was a bad thing. <laughs> In the late 70s, my dad, and it's weird because he's now like he doesn't smoke anymore, he definitely doesn't play pool, he just sort of, you know, he still works, he should be retired. But back then, you know, he had like a gold tooth, he got rid of the gold tooth, just like with a little star on it. And he would take me with him, my brother was too young, to the pool hall. And then it was smoke. I can't play pool, but, but thinking about that poem, which is sort of for some pool players at a place called The Golden Shuffle by Gwendolyn Brooks, is sort of what got me thinking back to this, this memory of my father. The Golden Shovel. When I am so small, Dad's sock covers my arm. We cruise at twilight until we find the place 
the real men lean, bloodshot and translucent with cool. His smile is a gold-plated incantation as we drift by women on bar stools with nothing left in them but approachlessness. This is a school I do not know yet, but the cue sticks mean we are rubbed by light, smooth as wood, the lurk of smoke thin to song. We won't be out late. Standing in the middle of the street last night, we watched the moonlit lawns and a neighbor strike his son in the face, a shadow knocked straight. Dad promised to leave me everything, the shovel we used to bury the dog, the words he loved to sing, his rusted pistol, his squeaky Bible, his sin. The boy's sneakers were light on the road. We watched him run to us, looking wounded and thin. He'd been caught lying or drinking his father's gin. He'd been defending his ma, trying to be a man. We stood in the road, and my father talked about jazz, how sometimes a tune is born of outrage. By June, the boy would be locked up state. That night, we got down on our knees in my room. <clears throat> if I should die before I wake, Dad said to me, it would be too soon. Uh, make sure we're keeping up with our time. I feel like something's wrong with this watch. Something's wrong with that time. Um, so I only read for three hours. How about that? <laughs> is that right? What's going on? Uh, okay, so Shakur. This is, is this the next poem? Yeah, this is the next poem. And, uh, you know, it's Tupac Shakur. I think it came up in the introduction. But it also, you know, I think I was in Nebraska or something, and uh, it was the winter time, and I was there with, like, the, it must be the only black guy in Nebraska. <laughs> so clearly he was crazy. And he kept driving me around because he was so excited, you know, to have some company. Anyway, so he told me inevitably about some, some kids. They were white kids, actually, doing meth, and then they pulled over to the side of the road. Apparently, meth's big in Nebraska. And then they uh, froze to death because they, you know, they turned the car off and tried to take naps or something. So I just was saying, like, what were they listening to? And I decided it was Tupac Shakur. Um, so Shakur, I'm coming at you live from the halfway out, where the winter morning stretches out like a white sheet over lovers the infinite has fetched. The still and bone blue white couple found parked, frozen on the highway. I'm thinking of them and the drug that made them think they were warm enough to chill. Because I know staying alive requires pills and a wicked streak. I'd need a head cocooned in bass. I'd need to be locked in a womb to hear your dopey two-note medley, your song pimped by wreckage, your light longing for lightness. I'd have to be as quiet as the youths whose youth made them stupid and lovely. They are God's niggas now, like you. I'm thinking of the stall of intoxicated cool that stalled you before it stalled them. I know men who want to die this way, smoke like snow, tattooing their bodies with narcotic holiness, the glaze of status, the faux lacquer of bliss. I'm coming at you live, frostbitten and thinking language is for losers because who cannot think our elegies are endless endlessly, and the words we put to them too often unheard and hurried. I'm coming at you live from the intangible. Do you want to ride or die crowded into a small space spitting, come with me? One day my song will be called Language is for Lovers. One day desire will not be a form of wickedness. And when you offer your drug, Oh, ghost, I resist. So I was thinking, uh, I should say, like, thank you, Lisa and Alan. Is Afton in here? I got emails from Afton. And then uh, Laura, who drove me here, she's ready. She was telling me about the, oh, yeah, because they got class. She told me that. So, yeah, well, they, they, won't, they won't hear it. But thank y'all for having me. I'm not, I, I really don't have good manners, but I do. I make an effort. I work on it. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about some of these poems in the middle. So these are the poems that I usually read outright just to get people laughing and stuff. But like I said, y'all seem so serious. <laughs> but this one, uh, 
it's appropriate, I guess, because it's an, uh, sort of like a Black History Month on <coughs> poem, The Avocado. And I, I hear there was a conversation about it. As long as you don't ask me what it means, when we're done, I'll, uh, I'm going to read it for you. The Avocado. In 1971, drunk on the sweet, sweet juice of revolution, a crew of us marched into the president's office with a list of demands, the black man tells us at the February luncheon. And I'm pretending I haven't heard this one before. As I eye black tortillas on a red plate beside a big green bowl of guacamole made from the whipped battered remains of several harmless former avocados. If abolitionists had a flag, it would no doubt feature the avocado also known as the alligator pear for obvious reasons. Number one, reparations. Enough gold to fill each of our women's wombs. Gold to nurse our warriors waiting to enter this world with bright fists. That's what we told them, the man says. And I am thinking of the money-colored flesh of the avocado. High in monosaturates, its oil content is second only to olives. I am thinking of my wife's caterpillar locks dangle over her ear. I dare you to find a lovelier woman from Cincinnati where the North touches the South. Three, we want more boulevards named for the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. An airport named for Sojourner Truth. The roots of the avocado tree can raise pavement. So it's not too crazy to imagine the fruit as a symbol of revolt on the abolitionist flag. We are all one kind of abolitionist or another, no doubt. And we are like the avocado, too, with this inedible ruby-colored seed that can actually sprout from inside when the fruit is overmature, causing internal molds and breakdown. Demand number 21, a Harriet Tubman statue on the mall. Brother man is weeping now and walking wet tissue to the trash can and saying, Harriet Tubman was a walking shadow. Or, Harriet Tubman walked in shadows. Or, to many, Harriet Tubman was a shadow to walk in. And the meaning is pureed flesh with lime juice, minced garlic, and chili powder. It is the salt and pepper Harriet Tubman tossed over her shoulder to trouble the blood. Many isolated avocado trees fell to fruit from lack of pollination. Goddamn, ain't you hungry? I whispered to my wife, and she puts a finger to my lips to distract me. Say, baby, wasn't that you waking me up last night to say you'd had a dream where I was a big, luscious, man-sized avocado? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's how the poem started, because she had that dream. Someone's belly is growling. We weren't going to be colored. We weren't going to be Negro, the man says. And I'm thinking every time I hear this story, it's the one telling the story that's the hero. Hush now, Harriet Tubman probably said near dawn, pointing a finger black enough to be her pistol barrel toward the future, or pointing a pistol barrel black enough to be her finger at the mouth of some starved, stammering slave, and then lifting her head to listen for something that no one but her could hear. And uh, so I think there's some relationship. I usually just choose like one from this section to read. I, I think there is a, a sort of relationship stylistically and in subject between this one and A House Is Not A Home, the next poem. Uh, I guess there's not that much to say about it. You know, I don't mind making up stuff in poems. Um, and this one is almost true. I'll tell you what's not true in at the end of it, I guess. A House Is Not A Home. It was the night I embraced Ron's wife a bit too long because he refused to kiss me goodbye that I realized the essential nature of sound. When she slapped me across one ear and he punched me in the other, I recalled almost instantly the purr of liquor sliding along the neck of the bottle a few hours earlier as the three of us took turns imitating the croon of the recently deceased Luther Vandross. I decided then, even as my ears fattened, to seek employment at the African American Acoustic and Ideological Accident Insurance Institute, where probably there is a whole file devoted to Luther Vandross. And probably it contains the phone call he made once to ask a niece the whereabouts of his very first piano. I already know there is a difference between hearing and listening, 
But to get the job, I bet I will have to learn how to transcribe church fires or how to categorize the dozen or so variations of gasping, one of which likely includes Ron and me in the eighth grade, the time a neighbor flashed her breast at us. That night at Ron's house, I believed he, his wife, and Luther loved me more than anything I could grasp. I can't believe you won't kiss me goodbye. You're the gayest man I know, I told him, just before shackling my arms around his wife. My job is all about context, I'll tell friends when they ask. I love it, though most days all I do is root through noise like a termite with a number on his back. What will I still? Rain falling on a picket sign. Breathy epithets. You think I'm bullshitting. When you have no music, everything becomes a form of music. I bet somewhere in Mississippi there is a skull that only a sharecropper's daughter can make sing. I'll steal that sound. More than anything, I want to work at the African American Acoustic and Ideological Accident Insurance Institute so that I can re record the rumors and raucous rhythms of my people, our jangled history, the slander in our sugar, the ardor in our anger, a subcategory of which probably includes the sound particular to one returning to his feet after a friend has knocked him down. So he didn't really hit me, that's the thing. Like, when I woke up the next day from my hangover, this is like the last time I got drunk, you know, it was years ago. But when I woke up the next day, I was like, he should have hit me because I was, we went to high school together and I was convinced that the girl had a crush on me back then, even though they got married, you know, high school sweethearts. So anyway, so I said, oh, I gotta write a poem. I gotta write a poem to sort of make it up. And I wrote it and I, I guess I must have sent it out and I realized I couldn't show it to him because I said, you know, you're the gayest man I know. <laughs> Which he is, even though he's married. And so, so I was like, damn, I can't show him the poem now. But, but there it is. Uh, I haven't talked to him since that night either. So. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, let me see here. Uh, I talked to him once or twice. All right, let me see. Uh, just moving through it. We should have like inter interjected questions while I was reading. But. <laughs> Let me see what I can read for y'all next. What have we been talking about? Here's something. Uh, I'll read like a few more humorous things, and then I guess I'll read some serious stuff. I do have like two, two new poems um, that uh, I can read, and then we can talk. So uh, 26 imaginary t-shirts. So they're just, uh, it's just what it is, t-shirts. So it's an absidarian. If you know what that is, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it. You, you should know what it is. But, uh, it's an absidarian, but all you got to need, all you need to know is that like there's a T-shirt right here. So I'm just pointing at the, and it's just like what would be on the T-shirt. That's all it is. So it starts with a. Absidarian is what it is. Absidarian. A B C D. If you don't know, you got you can't graduate from college without knowing the absidarian. I think. All right. Uh, Twenty six imaginary T-shirts. Anonymous. So I'm saying it because I want you to think about it. Just imagine yourself walking down the street with anonymous on your t-shirt. Anonymous. That's a good t-shirt. I think that's a good t-shirt. <laughs> Two. Written in blue ballpoint on a band-aid. Down with gravity. That's what I say around my house. I say down with gravity. That's what I say to the kids. Down with gravity. Uh, three. Breathing expert for hire. Now the t-shirt's here. Breathing expert for hire. Uh, four, this would be, I guess, an illustration. The profile of a man with a chihuahua hanging from his chin. Chihuahua. I was actually thinking of Thelonious Monk, because that little beard just curls. It looks like it could be a little dog or something, you see. But if you know Thelonious Monk. Uh, five, don't misbehave tonight. This is on a t-shirt, though. <laughs> Six, die and learn. Seven, the best way to wipe out poverty is to wipe out poor people. Sign the GOP. <laughs> Put that on the t-shirt. Eight, must see fully equipped fashionable sonnet with gorgeous slant rhyme and modest illusions missing half of last couplet. That'd be for like English majors, I guess. Uh, nine, I am no food. Which is almost like I am no fool either, but I am no food. 10, and this is like, this is really, you can't say this about your own poems. This is my favorite one. Like, if I really had an opportunity to make t-shirts, it would be this. I'm not shy, I'm sober. 
11. A face half Ali, circa Rumble in the Jungle, half Elvis, circa sequent Las Vegas karate get up. And then the caption is, float like a blue suede shoe. <laughs> because Elvis and Muhammad Ali sort of look alike, don't they? A little bit. They favor at, at different periods in there. <laughs> Around the 70s, they both started drifting. They could be, they could be cousins. Uh, 12. Let's pretend I'm still in love with youth. Uh, 13. So this, I maybe this is front and backwards. So like maybe uh, immaculate math would be on the front, maybe. And then this would be on the back. If Mary wakes an hour early for a month, at the end of that month, Mary will have more than a day. How much time will Mary have by May? Uh, 14. You got to think about the answer to that. 14 requires faith. Uh, this is not an exit means do not enter, which I think of as vulgar. I can't explain why. But that's something vulgar. So if you saw somebody with that on their shirt, like maybe this is not an exit means do not enter on the back, you would think something lewd. Um, <laughs> Fifteen, a worm slinking from the left nostril to the right above the caption, may Enkidu find no peace tonight. Who knows who Enkidu is? English majors should know that. Nobody knows that. Gilgamesh? There you go. Somebody knows. It. Okay. It was like, was he, like sort of, he was like Gilgamesh's Robin, like Batman and Robin, <laughs> I think. Uh... Oh, this is, again, you know, some of it is just stuff you say. And then you, I had one the other day. I was talking to my wife. I can't remember what it was now, but I was like, oh, that's for a T-shirt. I know what it was, academia nut. <laughs> that's what it was. I was like, T-shirt, academia nut. Because Roseanne Barr works on a macadamia nut farm or something. So I was like, academia nut. Okay. Uh, anyway, but this is just one of those things. Like, sometimes it just comes out. My hand wasn't in my ass. I was pulling out my wallet, which is what I had to say. Uh, 17, empty pill box in the caption, FDA approved pill for inducing amnesia. 18, the president in a blindfold of lizards in the caption, quandary. So I used to think that was Bush, but now I think it might not be. It's like, yeah, blindfold of lizards, quandary. 19, Freud's auto repair shop. Simple. 20, Albert Einstein in snake red stilettos and a lab coat above the caption, relatively too much time. <laughs> too much time. Uh, 21, the US map above the caption, what did it be above? Yeah, it's above the caption, the only thing that fucks you up more than poverty is wealth. I believe that. Uh, 22, did you call me Valentine? That's a good t-shirt too, like the wear out to the club. Did you call me Valentine? Uh, this would be like, uh, this is like Dick Cheney or something. This is his t-shirt. We won't get caught. <laughs> That's 23. He's right. Uh, 24. X for only one third the pornography sold here. Because people would think it was Malcolm X. Like X. Uh, 25. This is actually a line from a song from a, is it, it's not the title, but it's like the hook in a song from Precious Bryant. Uh, you can have my husband, but please don't mess with my man. I just wanted to give her a shout out. And then 26, zero preservatives also for your t-shirt. Because there are zero preservatives in you. Uh, and then you see the Z. We started with the A, after All right, let's see here. Enough laughter. What else do we have? Uh, so I do have some of these longer poems, but you know, it's already warm, and they definitely make me sweat. Just, I mean, I think that's why I wrote them, because they make me sweat. Um, all right, I'll, I'll read this one. I haven't read this one in a while. So this is the last one in the book. And um, so the, the poem is like broken up into these 20 parts. Do y'all hear that little ringing sound? I wonder what that is. I'll move this microphone. I'm mess you up. Uh, but I'm just going to read it straight through. So the poem is broken up into like 20 stanzas of really, you know, shortish stanzas. I'll read it. And uh, I guess everything's in it, you, you know, you need to know. I figure, you know, I, sometimes I end with this one, but I'll just, I'm going to throw it in here so we can get to some new stuff. So I'll read this and maybe a few more things from the book. Arbor for Butch. 
I am with my newborn son, and the man blood says is my father in a shit motel. And if each of us is, as I sometimes believe, the room we inhabit, he is a bed used until it's stained. Even if I knew this first meeting was our last, I would have nothing to offer beyond the life I have made without him. In the far south, where history shades everything, there are people who fear trees. I once heard an old man say, I may be black as a crow, but I'm white inside. Nowhere else does the sky do what the sky does there, where the graves are filled with dirt the color of fire. We drank whiskey until we were drunk, as the couple in the photo my mother gave me to show him the boy and girl swaying at the edge of my future. I watched my father curl on the bed like a leaf drained of its greening as my child cried the way rain cries when it's changed to steam. Because I believe the tree is a symbol of everything, one of us was a bough reaching across the road. One of us was a door opening and closing in the darkness. One of us was a boat being carried downstream. My father and I sat in a motel room beside a highway where his pickup was the shade of a bruise beneath the glow of the vacancy sign, where he and his talk began to evaporate. We were two fathers watching the faces of two sons, where the evening passed as it arrived, where the rain comes long-toed and crushing the high grass, swamping the land, where a slave talked his children out of running away with the bottom of his shoe. This is what it means to believe in ascension and fear climbing. In the far south, where sap jewels the bark, the teeth of the saws are sticky and bittersweet. But I wanted to carve a door out of the wood and around that door, I wanted to build a room because I knew what my mother wished for, and I knew what she would need. The arm of the boy falls around the girl, heavy as a branch in the photograph with the gloss that's been rubbed clean, and the blurred inscription which nearly delivers its message before vanishing. I drove the long night to see the face my son and I wear like a mask where history can be a downpour of joy or guilt spilling its wrong-headed desire all over the body, where a boy and girl fought in a motel bed to make me, one desire beating against another, where my mother seemed to blur, calling him her first lover even after she said she was raped. In the far south, my father, the first time I met him, said God made nothing sweeter than pussy. We smoked our history. We drank to our future until each of us was a head of steam, clouds above each other's dreams. The plan was, when I met him, to cut off his hands. Where, because, this man, because of this man, my mother would want me dead would want no limbs to branch inside her, no cluster of sound waiting in a drum, where she wanted to but could not shape her want into an ax. Sometimes my body is a guitar, a hole waiting in wood, wires trembling to sleep. To identify what you are, to be loved by what you identify, I thought, this is how the blood sings into the self. I thought what was hollow in me would be shaped into music. The first time I met my father, I believed I would understand the line connecting me to him. Because a man rooted to his kin can never be a slave. But he was like the road, skid marked and distant. Like the rain breaking above ground and beating into it. In the far south, or as one man swung from the limb of a tree, he said, I may be black as this bark, but my heart is light. Where even when your lantern burns out, they say the flame lasts. Where everyone I know is ablaze with this story and darkened by its ash. 
Certain arrangements must be made if you want access to the past. With his room without rooms and his truck without gas, my father was a nail bent in the shaft of a hammer, a wound the length of a kiss. I am with the ones blood says are mine. And if each of us is, as I sometimes believe, little more than a bray of nostalgia, we are like the village mule chained to its muling. My father fit a slim, ragged hand over the head of my newborn son and said, he sounds like a white child crying like that. What if blackness is a fad? Dear negritude, I live as you live, waiting to be better than I am. Before sleep last night, I thought how it would be to awaken with all the colors of this world turned inside out. And that was the name of my suffering. The story my father told me did not reveal one body inside another. The arms of the boy who would become my father, embracing the girl who would become my mother. It did not hold the sentence rooted to the beginning of my life. I am not doing anything now, except waiting like the bird who uses the bones and feathers of other birds to build its nest. I am on my bed of leaves thinking about the past, how my father dragged his shadow across the room the way a storm drags its rain. Where there were too many trees and too many names etched into the trunks, where the knots in the wood were the scars of old limbs, where to be reborn, the birch pine must be set aflame, where the door, if I opened it, might have revealed the lovemaking, or the abuse still waiting to be named. Um, so maybe just like a, I'll do one more from this book, and then I have these two poems, and then we can talk. How long have I been going? I guess I haven't been going that long. Maybe a couple more, a couple more. I said I was going to go for three hours, so I guess we're just getting warmed up. Um, then we can talk. Uh, So, I mean, we sort of talked a little bit about music. I am a bird now. So this is the title of this song, uh, this poem comes from this song and album by this uh, guy named Anthony. You guys know Anthony and the Johnsons? He's almost sort of like, actually on that record, he does a duet with Boy George. He's sort of like a new Boy George. So you think about like well, how crazy Boy George was for the 80s and then come to like, you know, now and then think of uh, Anthony. So that means he's a little bit paler more ghostly. He's sort of like, you know, like a white dude. Actually, this is what the poem is sort of dealing with. He's sort of just like a white dude singing Nina Simone. You know, like if you imagine if Nina Simone was like a cross-dressing, English kind of chubby white dude. <laughs> I am a bird now. But he can sing. He's good. You can't take too much of him at once, but if you like listen to one or two songs, you really like him. Uh, I am a bird now. When Antony, a man like Nina, with a shook note cornered in his quiver, dolls a wig of light the way a wounded head is dolled, and the song slung from his grimace is no longer part of the body, but shares some of its history. You know how I feel. The raw drawl drawn from the bottom of the throat. The hunger broken by what can and cannot heal in the much too dark to see. After the vase is asleep with the taste of the bit flower, its moodiness and lust, you know how I feel. Submerged in a clouded jar, altered and alert. The mind lightheaded and hot, run down and cloaked in awkwardness. You know what I sorrow when I lay on your back, beloved, and our lovemaking with your back to me is a form of departure. You know how I feel. Terrestrial as a marriage, like a wing when it is no longer part of the body. Slung from a horn carved of metal. Slickened to shine a phrase winding coil in the winded valves. The song which aches as it opens and aches as it shutters down. I should have said, you know, like that's a hook from uh, Nina Simone. Y'all know that, right? 
You know how I That song. Uh, it just stays with you though. Once you start it, it just won't go away. All right. Uh, okay, well, I, look, I mean, I got these two poems. I feel like I should read three more poems. So one here and then two there, and then we can talk. Like, what would be appropriate for y'all? Well, here's one. I mean, I talked about this one today in class. I was just talking about like poems that, well, the question was really about like, what does your wife think about your poetry, especially when you're talking about like sex and desire and stuff. And I said, she thinks I have a good imagination, <laughs> which I do. I do have a good imagination. You get married long enough, you know, you start having a really, really good imagination. So, uh, so Cocktails with Orpheus is actually, it's sort of that. It's sort of, I think, is about that, actually, in some ways. Uh, but I, I didn't remember writing it, and I had never shown it, shown it to her. It's like the only poem I've ever written that she didn't see before it went out of the house. But then I was somewhere reading it, and she was with me. So I was like, oh, I'll tell you about this poem. Cocktails with Orpheus. After dark, the bar full of women part of me loves, the part that stood naked outside the window of Miss Geneva, recent divorcee who owned a gun. Oh, Miss Geneva, where are you now? Orpheus says she did not perish. She was not turned to ash in the brutal light. She found a good job. She made good money. She had her own insurance and a house. She was a decent wife. I know how decent lives in the word descent. The bar noise makes a kind of silence. When Orpheus hands me his sunglasses, I see how fire changes everything. In the mind, I am behind a woman whose skirt is hiked above her hips, as bound as touch permits, saying, don't forget me when I become the liquid out of which names are born, salt milk, milk sweet, and animal made. I want to be human above the body, uprooted and right, a fold of please released, but I am a black wound, what's left of the deed. All right, so uh, here are just like, I guess I'll, yeah, I'll finish with these two poems. I feel like I've been talking a lot between the poems, so maybe I should just read them. Because um, I could tell you a good story about this New York poem, but that's, like, that's going to take 10 minutes. New York poem. R is in it, and he didn't see the poem, and then he saw the poem, and he was upset. So how about that? That's all I'll say. And if y'all ask me questions, I'll tell you what that means. New York poem. In New York, from a rooftop in Chinatown, one can see the sci-fi bridges and aisles of buildings where there are more miles of shortcuts and alternative takes than there are Miles Davis alternative takes. <laughs> there is a white girl who looks hijacked with feeling in her glittering jacket and her boots that look made of dinosaur skin. And R is saying to her, I love you, I love you, I love you, again and again. On a Chinatown rooftop in New York, anything can happen. Someone says, abattoir is such a pretty word for slaughterhouse. Someone says, mermaids are just fish ladies. <laughs> I am so fucking vain, I cannot believe anyone is threatened by me. In New York, not everyone is forgiven. Dear New York, dear girl with the barcode tattooed on the side of your face, and everyone writing poems about and inside and outside the subways, dear people underground in New York, on the sci-fi bridges and aisles of New York, on the rooftops of Chinatown where Miles Davis is pumping in and someone is telling me about contronyms how cleave and cleave are the same word looking in opposite directions. I now know bolt is to lock and bolt is to run away. That's how I think of New York. Someone jonesing for Grace Jones at the party and someone jonesing for Grace. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking about that when I was like, the, it's all made up. Like, dear New York, dear girl, a barcode tattooed on the side of your face. See, y'all know, like, Gucci Mane? Who knows who Gucci Mane is? 
You know, he's got an ice cream cone tattooed on the side of his face. That's crazy that I could imagine. I thought I was being crazy thinking about a barcode. This fool got an ice cream cone tattooed. Anyway, look him up, look him up, Gucci Mane. All right, uh, this is the last poem, The Rose Has Teeth. I don't think that, there's nothing to tell you about this one. Uh, obviously, I like, oh, I, I guess I could say this. This is the last poem. I do love music, obviously. I wouldn't be a poet without music. Um, but, and I have been playing the piano or trying to play the piano uh, for a long time, for like more than 10 years. But I feel like that's all I ever do is try to play the piano. So this is sort of playing around with that. The Rose Has Teeth. I was trying to play the 12 bar blues with two bars. I was trying to fill the room with a shot and awkward color. I was trying to limber your shuffle, the muscle wired to muscle. I wanted to be a lucid hammer. I was trying to play like the first mechanic asked to repair the first automobile. Once piano, every man-made song could fit in your mouth. But I was trying to play Burial's Ghost Hardware. I was trying to play steam and sequins for Larry Levon without all the artificial bells and smoke. I was trying to play the sound of applause by trying to play the sound of rain. I was trying to mimic the stain on a bed, the sound of a woman's soft, contracting bellow, the answer to who I am. Before I trust the God who makes me rot, I trust you, piano, something deathless fills your wood. Because I wanted to be invisible, I was trying to play like a woman blacker than an unpaid light bill, like a white boy lost in the snow. I wanted to be a ghost because the skull is just a few holes covered in meat. The skin has no teeth. I was trying to play the sound of a shattered window. I was trying to play what I felt singing in the mirror as a boy. I was trying to play what I overheard, the old questions, the hunger, the rattle of spines. The body that only loves what it can touch always turns to dust. What would a mother feel if her child sang, sometimes I feel like a motherless child too beautifully? A hole has no teeth. A bird has no teeth. But you got teeth, piano. You make me high. You make me dance as only a sail can dance its ragged, assailable dance. You make me believe there is good in me. I was trying to play California Dreaming with Jose Feliciano's Warble. I was trying to play it the way George Benson played it on the guitar his daddy made him at the end of the war. My lady, she dreams of Chicago. I was trying to play Muhammadu Bamba, like a band of Africans named after a tree. A tree has no teeth. A horn has no teeth. Don't chew, piano. Don't chew. Sing to me, you fine ass lounging harp. You fancy engine doing other people's work. I was trying to play the sound of an empty house because that's how I get by when the darkness in my body starts to bleed. I was trying to play autumn leaves because that's what my lady's falling dress sounds like to me. Before you piano, I was just a wrap of knuckles on the windowsill. I am filled with the sound of my lover's breathing and only you can bring it out of me. How about that, can we stop there? went long. I think I lost track of what I was doing with my time thing. So if y'all don't want to ask me any questions, I understand. <laughs> y'all have questions? If you have questions, that means I have failed in my project. <laughs> so the deal is, yeah, I went to the party with this guy, R. <laughs> he completely abandoned me to try to pick up 
you know, many women, women all through the thing. And then he just, I just sat on the couch, I fell asleep. It was like a New Year's Day party. I fell asleep, I woke up, you know, it was six o'clock. He hadn't gotten lucky with anybody, which made it even worse. It was even a bigger insult that he abandoned me the whole night. And so then we left and he said, oh man, I'm sorry, I got so drunk and I was chasing these women around. I said, I don't remember anything, I don't remember anything I said. But then I wrote the poem and I thought, well, he won't see it. But then I sent it to the New Yorker and of course they took it and then he saw it. And he said, man, that, that poem ruined my marriage. I was like, your, your marriage was ruined long before I met him. <laughs> so, but then he gave me a Grace Jones record, so I guess we're still friends. That's my story. All right, well, I guess that's it. I'm going to stop. Actually, I do. Yes, have a okay. What, what do you see as your relationship to history? Um, I don't know how I want to ask the question, but sort of outside of the act of writing poetry. Right. What do you see as your relationship to history? Uh, um, I, and you're saying, oh, like it's a deep question, so, but I don't know uh, if it's really that deep. Well, you know, it was reminding me of. Uh, in class today, I was just sort of talking about where poems come from, and sometimes, even when they're personal poems, there's a dimension of mystery that I can't figure out. And so I referenced the Arbor for Butch poem as an example. Like, I don't know, although your question is making me think about an answer that I have the next time someone asks me that. But I was talking about, like, I don't really understand the relationship between what's happening with the speaker, which is a Terrence-ish kind of person, in the room with the father, and then when it goes out to think about, like, what history means and, like, these ideas of... I'm black as this, but I want to be white, I'm black as this, but I'm like, all of that. So I was saying, oh, I don't know what the relationship is between those two things, but like when I was writing a poem, I just let it go. But when you ask me about my relationship to history, I mean, I think I hear sort of like, maybe that's what it is, like to think about going back and trying to like make these connections with the kind of like violent origins. And I've never really thought about that before. I have to watch the video later on and write it down. But I do, I think there's something, I. Because I've always thought about it. I know it's my poem, so I should know. But I think that there's some connection between, like, my relationship to history is one that's, like, fragmented mm -hmm. by virtue of, like, you know, having fathers and not having fathers. And, but still looking, you know, still trying to, like, do the Pandora thing. Like, you want the box to be open, even if there's all kinds of terrible things that might be in it. And so that is how I think about, you know, history. I was, I was actually, I was thinking about the way that the poem with, um, the, the 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 speaker at the Black History right oh yeah the avocado mm -hmm. right the right. avocado which right is is brilliant I mean uh -huh. I love it but I was thinking about the way that you sort of play with and almost mock right those of us that uh -huh. are thinking about history right right right, right. Who are a part of history and then right. these other ways where it's 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 really reverential right if you're your, yeah. your nod towards historical figures. And right. Well, see, now I have an answer for that poem. Okay. Because there is something that's going on with it. So one of the things is, this is a funny thing about like sending a poem out into the world and then having to read it. So there's a moment in the poem where it's like, every time I hear this story, it's the one telling the story that's the hero. Mm -hmm. So that can seem like a very good thing. Like he's the hero because he's here telling us the story. But of course, when I was in the audience, it was the way he was telling the story that was, so I was like, every time I hear this story, it's the one telling the story. That's the hero, you know? But like all of that inflection is gone from the poem itself. So I like that that becomes a kind of neutral line. But the other thing is like at the end of that poem, when Harriet Tubman is like, pointing at the mouth of the star stammering slave. And you think about what well, the speaker of the whole poem is like, I just want to get to that guacamole. I don't want to hear this story. So it is mocking, but at the end of the day, Harriet Tubman is coming for mm -hmm. the speaker because he hasn't been paying attention. So it's true, like, and that would be my relationship to, to history. Maybe that's a Richard Pryor kind of relationship to history. <laughs> like, you know, like you're gonna get burned as you play with the fire. So, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome, yeah. Yes. I haven't read your other books, but why or what do you think differentiates, or why do you think this one won the national? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I always like to think like the last, not just the last book, but I always think of oh, the last poem I wrote is like my best poem. So I would say, well, it's the last one, so it's the one I believe most in. But it is, uh, it's so random. I mean, it's so subjective. So I try not to think about it. I, you know, I wouldn't have given it to me, is what I would say. But you know, but I do think. Uh, the, book, the books just sort of come out of me, just trying to push stuff. I mean, again, to go back to like the 
Arbor for Butch poem, a lot of my poems are about fatherhood, in particular in the previous books. And so I just thought, oh, well, if I go do this thing in the real world, I can like move on. That's a really weird motivation, right? But I'm thinking, I'm so sick of writing about this. So let me just do this thing. Let me find this guy and then I'll be done with it. Of course, it just got even more extreme by finding them. But like that kind of quest is really what leads one book to the next, like sort of personal questions. And they are, they're historical, they're rooted in history, but it's a local history and then it's a broader sort of cultural history too. So that's all I'm doing. I mean, I don't know, you know, I try to keep things exciting so the books will be exciting, you know, but I can't say like how that becomes, how people read that. I mean, people have said it's like, there's a lot of stuff about marriage in it. And maybe that's unusual for like an African-American man to be like happily married and talking about it, I don't know. But when you try to think like, what's unusual? I just think, oh, it's just me, you know? So I don't know. Hide. So that's like a sound poem to me. Like it's echoes, but you have to sort of hear it out loud to hear the echoes going back and forth. And it's just sound. You know, all my poems, they got like, it's either, well, it's, I could tell you the three things like two guys on an adventure, even like the R poem, like two guys, that, two brothers, in fact. I think it's because I got a little brother. That's the, all of that, you know, there's that. There's music and then there's cars, you know, because we traveled a lot when I was young. So I'm like, oh, there's a car in that poem. So it's automatically recognizable as a poem by me. But, um, but it is right, like as you read it, go in the columns, there's like three different ways to read it. But for me, like each of the columns has a sort of echo across the two of them that you sort of have to hear to, to follow. So when you hear it out loud, you hear like this parallel stories, but within those stories is a, they're sort of connected by music. So it's not like a, it's, an, it's a lyric story more than a sort of narrative story, if that makes any sense. You just gotta read it out loud, yes. You mentioned like uh, halfway through Avocado that that poem was inspired by a dream that your wife had. Uh -huh. um, and I was wondering if, if writing poetry for you is kind of like a nonlinear process. Like, do you go from beginning to end, or do you kind of start with an idea and then build out from that? I think I know that was like halfway through the poem. Right. On you know on the day to day basis, it's like little inspirations. So, you know, like I go up at the end of the day and then I'm working some stuff. Like I didn't write down Academia Nut yet, but I will the next time I go <laughs> sit down. But by the time I like work that idea fully through, it probably won't be a t-shirt. It'll be something else. It'll just be like a glancing line or something. So it's just sort of accumulation, you know. And then certain stories just don't go away. Either the story is sort of big enough that I can sort of put it together at that moment. But generally that's not how, it's not even how I think really. I, it's so hard for me to, it's why I'm not a novelist. Like see how I can't get through that sentence? I'm sorry. I'm doing it as I'm trying to say it. Like I can't really do the, what is it? Subject, verb, predicate. So it's like verb, verb, applesauce, you know, that sort of. <laughs> so I write like that. I'm like putting, accumulating these different little bits and pieces and then at some point it can get shaped into something uh, useful. I, think, I don't even think I'm the first person to do that. I think like many people write like that, especially as you get older and you just like the stamina it takes to kind of get one story together in one sitting, it's just like it becomes more and more of a challenge. So it's like, let me just get what I can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you said your wife has a Pentecostal history, so were you Pentecostal? No, no. They tried to convert me. When, <laughs> I was just telling that story, but no, no. The preacher said, if you become Pentecostal, I'll marry y'all. I was like, well, we might not get married. <laughs> He's gonna do that. We found some other preacher, but, <laughs> but yeah, no. But I'm interested in that, you know. Like I'm, I, I was raised Baptist, Baptist, and you know, if you go through really all of my books, there's always an interest in sort of like spirituality and God and religion. But I mean, one of the poems in the book ends like it's it's a sort of political question. It's called Mystic Bounce that's posed to God, and the very end of the poem is like that's why I'm not a Christian. So to me, that was hugely radical because I was thinking, oh, if my mom ever sees this, she's going to kill me. <laughs> you know, so she hadn't said anything yet. But it's a philosophical question and sort of thinking about like how, how politics play into that. Really quick, quick poem. But, so those things often interest me. I think I'm more interested in like Pentecostal stuff than my wife is at, at this point. But it still interests me as like, you know, spirituality, how we deal with that, how we become spiritual, those sorts of questions. kid were you, what kind, what kind of things do happen with you as a kid or that you were interested in as a kid? Oh, so I was just saying this yesterday in the car, 
because I didn't think this was strange, but you know, this is just after kid. But when I was in high school, I had a like huge crush on Alice Walker. I'm trying to think who, it would be like the way other people feel about like Beyonce. <laughs> you know, like I had little pictures of her up. And this is like 10th grade or so, you know, and I just was like, Alice Walker. I was, because her daughter is coming to Pittsburgh, you know. So when I saw a picture of her daughter, I instantly, I hadn't thought about it for years. Although when I said to my wife, did I ever tell you that I used to have a crush on Alice Walker? She's like, oh yes, definitely, you told me. So anyway, so, and then what that conversation went to was like, you know, I didn't think that that was strange. Like I didn't, I just thought, you know, I have a crush on Alice Walker. But looking back on it, I find that peculiar. <laughs> so, so, but it, it, it's like those moments only in reflection that I think some of that stuff was strange. But at the time, it was really just, I, I say this about like the, me being a writer or an artist when I was in school, that my parents, because like neither one of them, my dad went in the military, but they didn't graduate straight through because my mom had me when she was 16 and then she didn't know my father and she married this other man who was in the military who raised me. But they didn't go to college, they barely got out of high school. So as soon as I graduated from high school, I had done, like, wow, this is pretty good. So they really left me alone. And so they didn't say, you know, do you want to be an artist or a doctor? Those conversations never came up. And they didn't say to me, you know, you're weird. So I really never, <laughs> I never thought I was weird until I was like a grown up and away from home. So I, to me, that was very useful to not have that kind of like, I mean, I thought about things, but I wasn't reflecting on myself as, because the other side of it is special. I didn't think that I was like, oh, I'm going to be an artist or I have something that other people have. I just thought, you know, this is just me being me. But when I look back on it, I think, you know, if that was my child, I would have been like, you, know, you need to get outside today. Why are you always in the room? You know, that kind of thing. But they never said that. So, yeah. All right. That's good. Those are healthy questions for me. I feel good. I learned some things. I learned some things today. I'm going to think about that the history thing and the Arbor for Butch thing. Uh, but thank y'all, good audience.